Um, look, we have a very, uh, I think, interesting and but a heavy topic, this idea of uh, the role of uh, institutions in, in development. Uh, so I'll just set this up and then introduce our panelists. Uh, the, the criticality of development institutions to, for our progress and prosperity is, I think, very well understood. But this Indian Independence Day, it's an especially timely discussion because of a confluence of trends. You know, even prior to the current pandemic, voices for more radical institutional reform have been growing. At the conceptual level, we're seeing a breakdown between the institution of democratic governance and the institution of capitalism, these things that seem to have often gone so happily together. Uh, our institutions of collective governance at the global level are failing in terms of shared objectives around sustainability and spreading prosperity. And at the same time, there are demands for more secular and for more non-secular institutions. Technology and social trends are shifting power between public and private institutions without actually seriously consulting the zeitgeist. Uh, think, think about data and how quickly those things are forming where how much are citizens even being uh, asked about what it is that they want as their future data governance. And adding to this powder keg is a pandemic that has led to a dramatic pause, which at best has led to a reflection, but also has led to clearer understanding of the limitations of current institutional structures and actually, I think a strong desire for change. So, so let's acknowledge that we're modestly holding this conversation at a time where there is clear demand for rethinking existing architecture. And so we have a great set of panelists to have that discussion. We will be holding this discussion at both the macro and micro level. There are mi macro institutions that represent our consensus and our norms. But these themselves are supported and often influenced by the leading bricks and mortar institutions that form what really is the tactile experience that we as citizens have. After all, you can have an institution of global governance that is enshrined in national sovereignty, but it is strengthened or weakened by the performance of the individual organizations underneath it, such as the various UN bodies. So we're fortunate today to have a remarkable panel that has operated both at the micro level building or advising on how to create leading institutions, but are also able to rise above the parapet and reflect on really what's the macro institutional ecosystem. So let me do this in, uh, alphabetically. Uh, we have Arun Myra, who with his 25 years of the Tatas and subsequently as uh, chairman of BCG India and also the Planning Commission of India, has uh, also been with the Planning Commission of India, has closely observed, advised and written about uh, India's institutions. Most recent of his books are Transforming Systems, Why the World Needs a New Ethical Toolkit, and Listening for Wellbeing, Conversations with People Not Like Us. Now, I don't think you should judge a book by its cover, but I'm very prepared to judge a book by its title, and those sound like damn interesting titles. Uh, so thanks, Arun, for joining us. Uh, we have Pramath Sinha, who is the founding dean of the Indian School of Business, a school that was ranked in the FT's top 20 uh, of B schools within six years of welcoming its first batch uh, just in 2001. Uh, he's also the founder and trustee of Ashoka University, a world-class liberal arts college, and then a whole string of things beyond that, which will take up too much time. Uh, but I do want to mention that his first love, as I found out, was actually uh, uh, learning and uh, higher education. So PhD, he did a PhD in robotics from the University of Pennsylvania. So he was doing machine learning back in the 80s. Uh, before it became as much in vogue as it is today. And then finally, we have uh, Rupa Purushottanam, uh, she's chief economist uh, and head of policy advocacy at the Tata Group. Uh, she's a co-author of the book, Brigital Nations, Solving Technologies, uh, People Problem, and also a co-author of the path-breaking, and I think we'll all remember this one, the 2003 Goldman Sachs report, Dreaming with Bricks. Uh, so uh, someone who truly can see what some of the big trends uh, that are going to shape us for the next 20 years. Uh, she was able to call that back in 2003. Uh, but aside from all of her publications and her work with the Tatas, uh, one thing that would be really interesting to hear from Rupa is herself building a fantastic institution as the founder, one of the founders of Absara uh, Leadership Institute. And we'll hear a little bit about that as well. So great to have you guys. Thank you for joining us. And maybe Rupa, I'm going to kick it off with you uh, with a bit of a tough and unfair question to put onto your shoulders. Uh, but help us set the scene a little bit. Uh, we're here to talk about the role of institutions in development. And the Tatas have been great institutional builders. So in the institutional architecture of India, as you see it today, what are you seeing as missing institutions? Um, and, wh and what are institutions crying out for reform? 
help us sort of warm up into this uh, pretty heavy topic? <laughs> that's not quite of a warm up. That's a that's a doozy of a question, Gaurav. Um, uh, so, I mean, it's so broad and we have plenty of missing institutions to talk about, but I just want to first start by saying that, um, you know, I don't want to fall into this trap. If I just even think about this past week, you and I have had some conversations and I just think of the number of institutions that have come up in conversation to solve problems. I can think of 10. We've talked about institutions that have to do with skilling, ag tech, community colleges, uh, municipal services, delivery. So I just, I feel like we fall into a trap where we think that there is an institutional fix for every de development problem out there. Um, I do think there are missing institutions, right? And so when you ask me a question like that, I guess for me, I will always come at it from the perspective of thinking, you know, what are the big trends that are happening over the next decade? And what are the institutions that we need to build for it, right? And so if you think about it sort of solving back from that, I would say like one would be around elderly care, thinking about how we're going to support the elderly, maybe looking at, you know, some of the difficulties in other countries right now in terms of the elderly care systems that they've set up and, and the, the weaknesses. The other big one that I would um, highlight, and it goes off the last conversation, is on gender, right? I think for India right now, if we could really institutionally think of you know an ambitious way to address the care economy for everybody that to me should be one of our top three priorities as a, as a nation um, and i think it can unlock so much right from economy onwards so i mean and we can keep, i think you know we can bring up lots of things that we see on a daily basis but i just want to make the point that we shouldn't be too quick to just dismiss all of these institutions that we have built at great pains either, right? And, and are, you know, many that are very well designed. And I think we also should think about how we make them stronger. And some of, some of that has to do with strengthening and, and making sure institutions can deal with issues of today. But for me, the biggest thing by far is that, you know, I've been working physically in India for almost 15 years now. And I feel like we have great institutions, but we just don't have the connective fibers between them. And if we're ever going to talk about scale, it seems like we're searching for the one institution that we scale up and it's going to solve everything. But really what's going to address scale is that we, we do have that connective fiber. And I just think that India suffers a lot in my experience. Um, we suffer from silos. So I would say that would be to me figuring out the institution that understands to connect all of these would probably be sort of a big force multiplier. Right. And let me just uh, sort of connect that to a question I wanted to ask uh, Brahman, because uh, I mean, w one of the things you highlighted is actually the need for connective tissue. Uh, but Brahman, I, I would argue you've been a little bit more of a maverick in, in terms of, you know, in 2001, when ISB came on, it, it, it was trying to do something quite different from the existing malaise. And I think your institutions subsequently have also tried to do something different. Uh, are you, uh, talk us through that and why you continue, I mean, what is the secret to some of that success? Because you've consistently had that. And, and what's the overall theory of change? Is it about building more connective tissue or are you trying to be more of a lighthouse to say, here's what's possible and help shift the mindset? Take us uh, into your thinking around your institutions. Thank you. You made my day. Nobody's called me a maverick so far. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a snippet out of your recording. Thank you. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's, 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 it's great to be on this panel. Uh, I, I think you picked up uh, on this well. Uh, personally, I've taken a more of a lighthouse approach. And you could argue that this is a bit of a cop-out approach. Uh, you know, people often tell me that, you know, I should get more involved in broader policy making or, you know, some of the connective uh, uh, ness that uh, Rupa is talking about. Uh, but I, I, at some point, I just felt like it was easier to build a, an institution uh, and, and do that and drive change that way. And I think you need all these different uh, uh, initiatives, right, to make change happen ultimately. But in our case, or at least in my case, I've been stuck in this model of saying, how can we create more and more institutions uh, that show up, uh, show the way? Uh, and uh, 
the one big thing that has been behind the institutions, and I have to say that I'm no expert on institution building other than that I've been involved in the setting up some of higher education institutions, is that uh, in all of these institutions, uh, you need, for, for institutions to do what they are supposed to do, uh, whether it's elder care or whether it's higher education or uh, any other field, uh, the best institutions in the world uh, are not owned by anyone. Uh, they are truly independent. Nobody owns these institutions, yet everyone who's involved in these institutions thinks they own them. Right? So the level of commitment and the level of uh, involvement of the people involved in those institutions, either in the building or running of those institutions, is extremely high. Yet, uh, from the broader uh, stakeholder perspective, these are truly independent of any ownership, uh, any particular individual or institution, or even the government, uh, you know, or, or, a, or a private organization. And so what we have tried to do at the heart of an ISB or an Ashoka or other institutions uh, that I've been involved in is to try and replicate that in the context of something new that you're setting up. Because in India and in a lot of these, you're setting up new institutions. And that's essentially at odds because there are going to be a few uh, people who will be involved in setting up an institution in the early days. It's almost like a startup, right? And uh, so you have the founders who are very vested and who would like to control it and who would like it done their way. Uh, but the contradiction in that approach is that if you really wanted the institution to outlive you, then you've got to let go. Uh, and, and, and so how you manage that process is really at the heart of building these lighthouse institutions. And I can talk more about that, but I'll kind of stop there to say that the governance of these is really at the heart of ensuring that they are successful. Uh, and achieve their objectives and, and purpose. And, and maybe it'd be great to get a practical example of that. You talked about governance being at the heart of this. What's an, what's an example of a, of a governance structure that allows these institutions to be sustainable in the way that you're describing? So very quickly and not to take up too much time. I mean, if you look at the best universities in the world, nobody owns them. So if you look at a pick any top university of your choice. Who owns them? You don't know who owns a Harvard or a Stanford or a Cambridge or an Oxford. Now, how do you replicate that at an ISP? When you have two or three people who are actually putting in the money, this is philanthropic, not for profit, but some people are putting in a lot of money uh, to make these things uh, viable and could equally say that, hey, we have a lot of say in how this institution should be built. And so what, what we have done both at ISB and Ashoka uh, is to say, listen, regardless of how much you contribute, you will only have one single vote. So effectively, all donors are, have the same decision-making authority or power, if you want to call it, which then diffuses the ownership in terms of decision rights. Uh, if you look at the contribution, there may be two or three donors who've actually given 10, 15, 20x of the, the smallest donor. But you compensate for that in other ways. You name a building after them. Uh, you create a center in their father's name. Uh, you create some chairs. And you, so give, you compensate them for that. And, you know, and this is the very traditional Western model, which we've replicated. But what you also do is use that model to say, aha, uh -huh, regardless of what you give, you only have that one vote. And so everybody gets equal say. Now suddenly what you've done is diffuse this tension that I was talking about earlier. Now, of course, some people will choose not to participate because they will want to have four board seats because they are giving four times more than somebody else. And we've actually had to tell people, no, we will not allow that. And people have walked away and we've lost uh, the opportunity to raise valuable and, and precious funding because of that. But setting that expectation and those ground rules from day one has helped us a lot over time. And what you raise is a part of a larger tension, which I, I know, Arun, you've been talking about when you when you sort of thought about 
at the big institutional levels in terms of our norms, right? There's a, there's a breakdown in consensus around this, right? Which is you want inclusion, you want uh, almost uh, representation. And at the same time, we have a property rights structure which says, you know, whoever is the investor should get the ownership, right? And, I, and this is, and people are now seeing that this is breaking down, that our, even our global institutions have a level of colonialism still part of them because they're owned by the people that gave, had that money at the beginning. Can, can you say a little bit more about what those tensions are and what you think will emerge out of this? What, what is a new consensus that's forming? Because I thought this was a really great micro version of that, which is, you know, even at the board level of, a, of an institution. What do you think is happening at, at a broader level? Is this breaking down this idea of uh, who invests gets to own? Aaron, you're on mute at the moment. It, ha it has to happen once, don't worry. <laughs> it helps me to <clears throat> clear my throat again, thank you. Yes, <laughs> at the heart of uh, the problem of governance um, has been pointed out by Brahma, that uh, we've got two conflicting principles that apply to the governance of uh, institutions. One of them is a much more longer standing principle, which has gone on for centuries, that those who own a property have a right to determine how that property will be used. And therefore, even in democracies like England, it was landowners who first had the right to vote, and those who didn't own had no rights to vote. And so it went on and you know, people got disqualified if they became paupers, for example, then you no longer had a right uh, to vote. So the principle that unless you own it, you have no say in how it is uh, to be used by society. Much more recently though, and the principle of democratic rights, that means those who do not own anything perhaps, but are citizens have a right, an equal right to vote, is still not a settled idea. We have this as a theoretical principle, but even the United States where it's coming to this whole thing about Black Lives Matter, how recent is it that in the United States, sort of the beacon of democracy, black people were given equal rights to vote, okay? So this is a most recent principle. And these two principles have been uh, clashing in civilization, clashing in civilization. And the principle of property rights is the pr principle by which business runs. So when you talk about free markets and business institutions having a larger say because they create wealth, the wealth creating institutions, um, they would be constantly protecting the rights of their shareholders, the people who own. Whereas on the other side, we're saying, no, no, no. The people who own nothing should have a say in how society is governed. Now this we come down to, therefore we have to redesign, I'm saying, Ramat said very well how the redesign of an educational institution could be done on the principle of, well, you all have equal rights, whether you put any money in it or not, or put little or more. I'm saying in business institutions also, the people who work in the institution, who give their whole life, and they may not put any money in it, should have as much say, perhaps more say, than some remote investor who maybe owns the whole institution in terms of a property right. So this is where the human right, the beating hearts that work, must have more say perhaps, or equal say at least than someone who owns. Now this idea is, where we come down to the reform of business institutions, which is picking up. When you talk about social enterprises and people are saying that a social enterprise is one that produces social good. One of it is, yes, it doesn't damage the environment, hopefully, like a pure business institution, which just exploits the environment to make, convert it into money wealth or digital wealth for people. The second, more importantly, is a social enterprise enables the people in it, who work in it, to increase their own wealth. And how is this done? That they own the institution. So any profit that is produced is not passed away to someone who began by saying it is mine and I will determine A, how it is done, and B, whatever profit is surplus produced, it comes back to me and I can choose then to grow this particular institution or do this fancy word now, I exit. And the faster venture capitalists exit, the better they think uh, they are at their business. You know, how long? Don't take too long and exit with a large valuation as soon as you can. So we have been dominated too much in the last 20, 30 years particularly with uh, the thoughts about 
venture funds. And just to simplify and make our argument interesting, we try to run our societies um, like venture fund, venture investors would be running our societies. Go back to it. You know, the people who are on the ground in the villages, working in their own fields, working in their own small enterprises, they must be the owners of all the assets that they are using in the production, or at least if they don't own them, they must have the right to determine what is done with those assets to make them more productive. So this redesign of business institutions to run by the principles that Pramath is saying is the 21st challenge, century challenge for civilization. Because the idea of running societies as free markets and money flowing around the world has gone, if I might say, a bit too far. We've come to the point where migrant capital has far greater rights, oh, enormous rights, legal rights, than migrant labor has. Migrant labor doesn't have opportunities or legal rights when it moves, unlike migrant capital. It can go in and out wherever it wants to, and migrant capital is allowed to sue elected governments, take them to courts and arbitration to say, it was unfair that you taxed us or changed the rules of taxation on us, you can't do this. But the people there said, we need your money, and you have been using us to produce our profits, and we need it now to improve ourselves. So I'm sounding ideological, but I'm not. I'm talking about the design, the architecture of decision making, and what it's associated with in the world today. No, not at all. I think the amazing resonance right now in terms of, and it's a beautifully put to say, you know, migrant capital has more rights than migrant labor. And I think it's visceral because we've seen it on the streets uh, actually uh, play out. So, Aaron, you brought a very strong inclusion lens. And uh, I think there are two things I'd love to explore with all of you around the, on the inclusion lens. One is, in a way, you've talked about institutions for the poor rarely are by the poor. And that creates uh, dissonance. But I think something else, which uh, at least I observe, is that the institutions for, of the poor, or for the poor, I should say, not of the poor, for the poor, have very low expectations. They suffer from a interest. It, it's a it's an uh, target setting is about trying to get to the average. If you look at education, it's like how do I get a whole mass of people to an average, even though the average is constantly moving. And so I want to throw this question to Rupa, and I want to bring in some of that ground level experience you have in trying to build a, a leadership institute. Uh, for young girls uh, that is really trying to offer what is a very elite education relative to what is actually normally available when we talk about doing education for girls. So um, I, wanted, I want to hear your thoughts around this thinking of actually going from what usually our education efforts are about, which is let's, you know, large scale, help people get to the average, where you've taken the tack of let me actually build serious leadership and send girls to some of the best universities in the world. Why did you do it? Talk us through that experience. So, yeah, I can, uh, let me talk you through that. But when you're talking about low expectations, it just reminded me of this. I just want to tell you this one story about, um, about Asura. So, you know, we had a, a donor doing a due diligence review, um, I would say maybe two years ago. And, you know, so we were prepping ourselves for it and, uh, and someone came to interview all the stakeholders. And um, she went to talk to our parents and she came back to tell us what the feedback was from our parents. And, you know, we have a great uh, parent network, but we were a little bit nervous because we have no textbooks. Our students run parent teacher conferences. We have a leadership curriculum. So we do a lot of stuff that, you know, uh, has, has challenged and, and stretched um, people's expectations of what education should be. So we we're bracing for all of this. And then she came back and she said that the, feedback that she got by and large is that parents said, um, you know, at Upsara, I feel respected and teachers and administration are kind to us. And that's not what we ever experienced in our previous schools. And so if, you know, that doesn't set the bar for low expectations, I don't really know what does. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to explain that. I think from the ground up, we have really low expectations. And then I think from a policy level, we have these gold standard, uh, very high expectations of what we think we can achieve. And then when it's so difficult to achieve those from survey design, you know, everything that we do in our, in our lives, we have these, you know, things that are very hard to reach and then we have no middle ground and then it's, it's kind of like, you, know, you, you just drop. But to the question about lighthouses, you know, I think 
to me, it just comes down to the fact that aspiration comes from exposure, right? And, and I think you need to have lighthouses to show the art of the possible and not in a conceptual way, right? We talk about lots of examples of what happens in other countries, but when you can show something aspirational happening in the specific context you're in, and that raises expectations for what something like education should look like, I think that will move us further, uh, further down the line. So that's why I think, you know, it's not, we suffer from always saying it has to be either or, but we need, you know, in that, you know, we need a little bit of all of it working together to move us forward. Yeah, I think it's uh, remarkable that if you look at surveys in India, you'll see that the trust in government institutions is actually remarkably high uh, within citizens. If you ask citizens, what do they expect government to do for you? It's remarkably low. So we have high trust of low things happening for us, uh, which is, which is, an, uh, which is you know, partly drives the institutional incentives as well. And I, and I guess I'd open this question up, but certainly, um, uh, Brahma, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts as well on how, what are the kind of institutions that you see are actually raising expectations, actually demanding more, you know, and uh, all of you have had such great experiences. I mean, what are you seeing out there that are actually um, making us think about a higher quality outcome rather than everything being about the lowest common denominator at an institutional level? So I'll have to think a little bit about this, which is probably why we have this topic uh, uh, for discussion. But uh, maybe this is just a, 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 a recency bias. But I think that a lot of what the government has done recently with the national education policy uh, is a big step in the direction of quality. Uh, I think our focus in... Uh, there was a lot of rhetoric around quality in the past, uh, but uh, at least what was happening on the ground was a big push towards access uh, and uh, uh, at, the, at the expense of good quality. Uh, it, you could argue that we've actually diluted some of our existing institutions and allowed quality to decline uh, in our push for access, at least in education, both higher and uh, and, and, and that has led to the kind of reaction that you talked about, that mm -hmm. there's a lot of trust, but, you know, in, in, in education, that trust has also gone more, more and more people. We have the highest number of kids going into private education, both at the school and the college level across the world uh, in uh, happening in India. Uh, but back to your point, I think uh, uh, the the current push to completely reform education to set up new institutions like the, the reform of the UGC and the AICTE, the, reform, the setting up of the National Research Foundation, very much like the National Science Foundation, uh, the setting up of National Technology Forum and the recognition that technology has to be brought in to deliver high quality education to the furthest student. Uh, uh, and so on are actually uh, very, very strong steps in the right direction. Now, uh, I, I do want to say that I do understand that this is just a stated intent uh, and, and it's, it's a policy document and it'll have to be translated into reality. And I'm sure Arun can talk about some of the frustrations of translating that into reality based on his experience at the Niti Aayog. Uh, but I think that uh, it, it, and as I said, it, it's, it's very recent in my mind, so I can't help but uh, mention it. That I think that's a big push that if we can at least make some of it even happen, it will be a big change. Uh, I'm personally trying to take the tack of pull, pulling a bunch of people together, including people in government, to understand that without the help of technology, we will not be able to deliver quality at scale in our country. Uh, and I think that's a big theme that uh, a number of people do get. Uh, and I, I'd stop in a minute to only say that, you know, the scale of all our social problems, the, the, the size and the scale, forget, you know, of course there's complexity and so on, is, is something that we have never seen in the history of the human race. Uh, uh, and, and there's just a reality given our numbers whether you take, you take anything that we take on. 
And I'm convinced that while we'll continue to build traditional institutions and, and use traditional models uh, to address our challenges, unless we use technology uh, as, a, as almost a, a, a key uh, uh, lever uh, to, to make a change at a scale happen, uh, different from the way people are using technology in the rest of the world. Uh, we, we, we will not be able to address the scale challenge that we have. So I think that's another aspect of it that I would like to emphasize. We'll stop there. Aaron, I think you were coming in. Yes, yes, Gaurav. Um, um, I mean, these questions are leading me to say, look, what we are saying, as uh, Pranad just said, he said, unless we change something fundamentally, um, we won't be able to address these very complex challenges with not just India's facing, the whole world is facing, but then he slipped in, unless we use technology. And I was reminded when I started consulting 89, 90 in the United States, that's where technology had started to grow and Michael Hammer and the whole thing were re-engineering the corporation. And the lesson learned was just by putting in technology, you're not going to improve things. You've got to redesign the process. And we've come to a time now in the world, we've got to redesign the architecture of institutions. And let me be very concrete. When I was invited to join the planning commission in 2009, the challenge given was that the way India is going about planning and trying to implement change in very complex matters, all sorts of matters, everything is not working. And people demanded that abandon the planning commission and create an implementation commission. Don't make another plan, just implement all the fine plans that you have made. And like, It'll apply to the NEP now. Don't. How are we going to implement this? So we got down to it, but we did it in a practical way. We asked uh, people in various sectors of industry that we've got to grow manufacturing and industry in India to create jobs. You people, I mean, most of them private sector, but along with the people in government who allocated those responsibilities and international experts in those industries, make a plan for India for your industry say what you can do as private enterprise and what you would require in terms of support from the government, infrastructure support or whatever support is required from the government and say how much you'll be able to stretch the growth of your sector in India and how many more jobs would you create? These two outcomes you want to see. And we had consulting companies galore wanting to work with me to say, we want to get into this action to understand how India works and to contribute to it. So McKinsey's and BCGs and Bain's and KPMG's, each of them allocated one of these industries. But the objective was to understand from all of them, why was it that India, in spite of having plans, and we've had plans for these industries previously, can't get it done. So we had a steering group, which were great people from industry and from academia, listening into each of these working groups. And there were 26 of them. And they were required to present periodically questions that they had come across and answers to previous questions and so. So we were learning about the system and why it doesn't work. And we came down to finally this, that what is preventing India from realizing the objectives of all the plans it makes or policies that it announces is yes, implementation. And why is there no implementation or insufficient? There's too much confusion, and Rupa pointed that out, too many silos and lack of coordination. So then we said, this is, the famous saying of uh, the lady, as you know, who did the best for uh, system thinking, Donella Meadows, who said every system is perfectly designed to produce the results it's presently producing. So if the present Indian systems, the results it's producing is confusion and lack of coordination, what is it about the design, the architecture of our institutions that is causing this to happen? And very clearly, let me give you an illustration. Skilling was realized by everybody that basic thing is skilling. Unless you have more skilled people, industry will not be able to be productive, won't give them jobs, et cetera, and et cetera. So what did we do? We created a central skilling ministry. Okay, but the central skilling ministry can only look at on a large scale everywhere, standardize and produce skills, but the people need jobs. So you need a central industry ministry and there was one. They need to coordinate. The skills must match industry and the timing of growth of industry must match the pace at which skills are coming. Then you say, but there's an education ministry in between. So education is a big problem. 
So we must have one central ministry and one commission. This is the way we think. And we great management consultants help clients to think like this. Focus, create a dedicated group, put the best people into it. It's not just business. Government runs like this too. This is a universal way of thinking of how to organize. Get focused. And if there are 10 problems, you'll have 10 ministries. If you've got 17 problems that the world is facing, we'll have 17 goals in the SDGs. Each of them will have their experts and their teams and, and ministries from their respective governments. And there's more confusion because you've got to then coordinate amongst all these experts. And they understand each of them are part of the system only. And if they move too fast with their solution because they are better endowed and better supported like skill ministry was for a while, you end up with the backfiring of your solution that you produce more skilled people who spent their time and money and then say, but there are no jobs. And they get mad with you as a government. So we don't trust you. So trust in institutions breaks down because of the architecture. And you see, we have been doing it like smart management people. If there's a problem, get focused and, and do it. Right? Now in the NGO world, in the civil society world, I've noticed the same, okay? That look, I take this cause, but there's another aggravation that is caused that I so passionately care about it and I'm doing it like for free almost. So I'm investing myself with my ego in it. And then you have another NGO working on the same territory. And they say, but I am doing it better. So when I was in the planning commission, we said, okay, we've got these social problems. We want to hear from the NGOs, their solutions. So we said, okay, there's women's problems, child problems, Dalit problems. In each of them, there were 20, 30 very eminent NGOs, some local, many foreign funded in here, said, you collectively tell us what is the solution. They told me, Arun Mayra, are you living in some fool's paradise? Do you expect, you know, great women who are greatly admired for the work they do to listen to each other and tell you an agreement for the solution for the women of India? We have our brands, we have our solutions. You got to listen to each of us separately and figure it out. I said, I don't understand the subject. You say you understand it. Please listen to each other. And for the sake of the women of India, you come to one solution. But see, this is the ego problem coming in between. The first one was maybe you might say it's a science and scientific and expertise problem. So we architect, we architect solutions and, and institutions which then create these problems of coordination and confusion, which we then say come in the way of implementation. So how do you solve this? This has to be solved by getting coordination at the local level, at the smallest level. Because that is where all the different forces combine in their unique ways. The problem of women in Kerala are not the same as the problem of women in Bihar. And the condition of the environment, physical environment in Kerala is also different compared to Bihar. And so you go, the quality of the infrastructure is different. These different forces, all three of which need to be improved, combine in their particular ways in every locality. And so we need local system solutions collaboratively designed and implemented for these big global systemic problems that we have. This is a very fundamental shift. We will always as experts kick it upstairs and say we need another big commission, more budget to that ministry, and then it gets solved. It will not because each of our problem, whether health or education or enterprises is interlinked. And we're noticing this in COVID. We've got the doctors telling us what the solution is to prevent the virus, physical separation. And now the people who have to run supply chain say, but that's you know, messing up people being able to earn their dying of hunger. So please, can't we coordinate? <laughs> yeah, in fact, I want to dive a little bit into that because COVID has been an example where uh, the, you know, it's very clear that the more localized an economy we can give, and you know, this is, there's plenty of studies now to show that people have created much more ground level solutions and allowed uh, governance to sit at a local level have performed much better. Uh, and so actually I, I wanna bring that back to a point Rupa made earlier around the, the fact that it's not about necessarily new institutions, it's also about the fabric uh, between them and the, and the links uh, between them. Actually, did, did we just lose Rupa? I don't know if I think we might. <laughs> I was just about to throw a, a question. Yes, away. we have uh, lost her, Gaurav, I think. Okay. Well, I'll I'll, uh, I'll bring this question back to her. But then, then I guess the question I'll bring it back to you, Pramath, which is about you raised the point of technology. And if you actually one thing which I thought that um, the point that Arun made was that it needs to be local. Now, the, often in the past, the idea was a lot of synergies and so forth exist 
by having that top-down view. But today, because of technology, you can run much more networked organizations. That means someone who's running at the ground level can still have all of the knowledge or access to the knowledge that someone very far away has. Do you think that because of technology, we can actually just run fundamentally new systems of governance and architecture for these institutions? Can they be much more decentralized as opposed to the traditional pyramid models of peak bodies and then you know a, a middleware and then people on the ground? Yeah. Uh, listen, I'm no expert on this, uh, but I'll tell you what my, my current experience suggests. Uh, I don't think you have to take technology all the way to the ground, but what technology allows you to do today is what Arun is talking about, where you allow the end user to control the, what they receive uh, and customize it to their needs in Kerala or Bihar. And I think that's the powerful notion. But to do that, I go back to what Arun also said. That you have to design things from a clean sheet. Uh, you can't be looking to fix existing problems or to, 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 to supplement and technologically just enable what is going on today. I think if you really want to use technology to your advantage, then you have to think from the ground up in what models can I now deploy, which will solve things at scale, which will take care of some of the silos that we were discussing, and which will allow people at the ground level to customize. Now, again, this is sounding very conceptual and philosophical, but let me give you a simple example from the world of education. Now, the truth is that there are at least half a dozen examples around the world already. And this is going to happen in India, trust me, where the last student gets to learn from the best faculty or experience the best possible course on a particular subject. In the past, that was by, by, by definition not possible, because if you wanted to get high quality education, you had to go to an elite institution, right? And it, the, the education was by definition, high quality education was by definition elitist. But today you can take the very best of the faculty and through the medium that we are using right now, or even through recorded asynchronous courses as they are called, take it to the last student. Of course, I know that many people would be jumping up and down in the current problems and saying, listen, people don't have access and so on. And I, 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 I agree. And I think that will get solved for over time. You put that issue aside. So now you have to completely rethink the way you deliver education. You can't just be saying, okay, I'm, I'm in Ashoka University and I'm going to now start educating. I mean, of course you'll do that. And that's a no brainer. But if you now have access to technology, which allows the last student to consume education, at their own behest, right? In their own control as and when they want it. Uh, then you have to completely redesign the system uh, and think of what possibilities they will exist to educate, you know, the government claims by 2035 that we would have uh, 80 million students in education. The only way you're going to reach them is through this model. So what is the new model with which you teach 80 million students and you get every student the best course on mathematics 101 that you could get in the world. But Pranav, you, your, your vision does seem to suggest a greater level of equality. But I yes. guess one argument would be if the governance is not as equal, will the outcomes ever be? And what I mean by that is if fundamentally institutions remain governed by elites as opposed to you know institutions of the poor by the poor right we right. whether it's collectives and so forth because doesn't the average keep moving you know sure new technology is coming in but that just means rich kids are just using that new technology in an even more advanced way and then the gap continues how are you solving how can we institutionally create an architecture that is fundamentally and this is one of the questions i think audiences are asking as well that is also driving equality as a as a piece of architecture? Because are those yeah. incentives there? I, 
Okay, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm challenged in answering the question because I, I don't know if I'll give a politically uh, incorrect answer here. But I don't think it is about bringing the people who, have, who most need it into the governance and the setting up of institutions. Of course, you wouldn't exclude them. Uh, but I do think that you need to bring people who are elite by, you know, whatever definition, who also have their heart in the right place. Right. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said about experience of setting up large institutions, doing things at scale. And I think you need both. Uh, I, I think you need a combination of these things. I think you need the best people in the world to be working on the toughest problems. And by best, it could not doesn't necessarily have to mean the best educated. Uh, you know, I take the example of an organization uh, that I've been involved with, uh, Pradhan. Right. Pradhan was set up by Deep Joshi and Vijay Mahajan uh, almost 40 years ago. I, I say, or you take Seva. Uh, you know, these are all like institutions that I have a lot of respect for, and they've had amazing impact on the ground. And if you look at it, their model is a mixed model in this, I, at least the way I see it. They may not characterize it that way, where their whole model has been that, hey, let's bring in the best minds and get them to come in and devote their life. In, and in their case, that's what people have done. These are very well-educated people, qualified people, uh, and, 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 and dedicated to the cause. But at the same time, their model involves people on the ground, right? So, uh, and they are setting up institutions on the ground under the larger umbrella of a Pradhan or Seva, where they are empowering local self-help groups and women in those self-help groups to build federations and institutions for collective uh, uh, enterprise and so on. So I think there is a, it doesn't have to be one or the other. And that's all I'm asked. I'm no, and, and, and again, to push you, and I'm going to actually throw this to, to Rupa, because, you know, as someone who's trying to build an, uh, an institution that's trying to create leaders from, uh, from low income backgrounds, right? I, I'm not suggesting that you, you take in people who are necessarily not qualified. But that's, I mean, I think the big part of the debate going on right now across the globe is about inclusion from a representation perspective. How do our boards, for example, start to have people who have, in fact, come from very low income backgrounds and have made something of themselves, right? That, oh, that, and, and, and maybe, Ruba, that's something you can just talk a little bit about. And I, I think before you dropped off, I was going to ask you uh, also, and I, I also know this is really uh, close to your heart also from a gender perspective, but I also wanted to uh, talk to you a bit about COVID and what are the schisms that the, the current pandemic thrown open about what's working in our institutions and what's really not? Okay, I have, I have so much to say right now. I don't even know where to start. I think on this whole question about technology, I, won't, I don't think we have enough time, but you know, you know, Garak, we spent, I spent two years working on this book and it was all about solving technology's people problem. The whole point was that technology is about how we design it. And if we're not solving for the problem that people have rather than the problems that technology has, we're going to keep running into this. And so I won't go into it, but I think there are very real answers for how to do this without just inventing a stack, right? Stacks are not going to solve development for India. But if you look at things like health and you combine that with, you know, having ASHA workers being able to be technologically augmented with tablets, you have connectivity between sub centers and tertiary care, and you really focus on primary care as being the strength, the thing that needs to be strengthened, we can do a lot with healthcare and technology um, augments that. But it's, it's part of thinking about, you know, not solving health, but solving care coordination. Okay, so I but I'll leave that aside. Uh, COVID or leaders? Um, COVID, uh, you know, you and I both have been writing a lot about um, COVID and its impacts. I think to me, there are like four big buckets, if I can go quickly, um, when you talk about sort of institutional fissures or, or breakdowns. And if you go back to the beginning, I think, you know, one of them has to do with the, the, the coordination and, 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 and so on. But three are really institutional gaps. So the first is that we've seen, um, you know, a ton about coordination between center, state, and local in terms of the health response itself. So, you know, this isn't coming from me, but all the interviews that we've been doing with medical professionals and so on, the confusion that has arisen. And, and you know what, it's, we have, no one expected COVID. Uh, India's complexity is far more, you can't compare it to a Taiwan. All that being said, I still think that the, 
um, the, the, the lack of coordination has, has exacted um, uh, a, a huge price in terms of um, how, how local response can be tailored. Um, and that's coming from all the interviews that, we, that we've done on the ground. I think the second big one um, has to do with data uh, and, and, and data protection. And I think we usually think about data privacy as individual and state or maybe individual and big tech. But COVID brings up this whole thing that now we're sharing our health information with our employers, with our retail stores, when we're going to a sports event. And so I think this whole question of how does that get, uh, get handled um, brings up an institutional gap. Um, the third one is, is, is informal labor, right? And, and by definition, our informal workers, which is close to 80% of our, our workforce, don't have an institutional backbone to support them. And we've seen all the problems of trying to get direct payments um, to the people that need them most, and also to try to target employment and reskilling opportunities. Um, and the fourth is, is gender, right? So we've seen these outsized impacts of COVID, both in terms of care burden for women, as well as disproportionate employment impacts, not just in India, around the world. And again, I think, it, and, and the last session was talking about domestic violence as well. So there's lots of things that are impacting women. Where do they go? Um, so I would just, you know, the, the, there's many more, but I would say those are four. Mm -hmm. On leadership, last, last, really quickly, if I can just say, this is exactly the point of why we started Ufsara. I think I've seen it throughout my life, right? We, there are institutions that try to be inclusive and, you know, a lot of times that means representation. And you might have people from underrepresented communities, women, join a board, join a task force, whatever it might be. On one hand, you know, you're asking people to join an institutional culture, a language, a set of norms without having anywhere near the same level of uh, training and, and, and just level of being equipped as other people. But the second thing I think is even more pernicious, which is, you know, when this happens, an or the organization and the institution itself has to be ready for the change that it's bringing on. It also needs to understand the norms and the language that people are coming to them with and be prepared to change. And I think that, you know, I've seen it and I still see it today. There's a lot of representation, but is there real uh, need for change in our institutions themselves doing the work on these issues? I would say there's there's a long way to go. And, and I know Aaron, you wanted to come in on this. I, I do want to ask you one specific question as you come in, which is, as someone who also operates at the global level in thinking about what could the new uh, institutional architectures be, is there anything particularly Indian that's coming out from India, from India's experience on building institutions that, that are trying to be more inclusive that that we can learn from that is maybe potentially influencing future architecture of of governance yes yes you know uh, pranath had said something about education and the best in the world should be available to everybody the best teacher should be available to you know and in any subject in each subject to everybody uh, he also said in the earlier discussion we had pranath and i was really struck when you said the real solution to education for children is good teachers. The teacher is the person who brings together many things. The experience of the child is able to understand the pace at which the child is getting or not getting. And so all these things which are being fed in world-class inputs delivered have to be combined together in that system called the child, in a system called the classroom. So it's the, if you will, the the effic efficacy of that little system that will determine whether all the children there are developing in spite of world-class inputs or not. And so this comes back to the design of governance. We found that until communities themselves take charge and say, this is our understanding of what is going on here and what we need and what the gaps are. And these are the things that we need from elsewhere. So in other words, I have determined, we have determined the type of house we want to live in and we know whether we want a chair or a table and what type of chair or table. If some specialists in chairs are telling everybody, you all use the same chairs and telling someone else, you all use the same tables, but my house conditions are different. We'll have a, if I can use a Hindi word, a complete khichuri in those places. So it has to be the local people asking people about that if you're so good at this, this is what I want and that I don't want. So don't trust it on me merely because 
with your goodwill and good heart, you're giving me world-class inputs. Okay. So examples from India, this thought that locally communities, if they take charge of themselves and we respect that they can do so, they will create goodness for themselves and thus the whole country can get transformed. This is Mahatma Gandhi's idea, let's call it, it's not just his, but he kept saying so. Local communities respect the women there, respect the men there, respect the Dalits there. They will have to work out their business solutions and also their own local governance solutions and support them, help them build that capability. Now this thought that unless property is owned by somebody, it will not be taken care of is this tragedy of the commons of Hardin. And poor Hardin, he said so, but he kept till he died saying, I've been misunderstood. It was a little experiment I did in which the conditions, I mean, the controlled experiment, it was true. But in real life, where there are many other forces, this does not hold. Now the world is saying, my goodness, we learn, need to learn how to manage the commons. And we realize that unless the commons are managed locally by the people who understand their own commons, we cannot manage the global commons. So Alina Ostrom, the first woman to get the Nobel Prize in economics in 2009, after 60 men had got it already, was a woman who got a Nobel Prize for economics in managing the commons. It was not fancy global economics. It was just people using their own resources and getting efficiency and equity while using the resources. And more than half of her, her research was in India. And it's very strange then. And I'm saying when she came to visit us in the planning commission to speak, there were only two members of a 11 or nine member planning commission who showed up to hear her. Because the rest said, I mean, this is some woman talking about some Jola stuff. You know, we, let's hear when Stiglitz comes or someone comes, we'll hear real economics. I mean, Stiglitz, of course, is different. And so this Arun, is- We just have about 10, 20, 30 seconds just before- the, uh, Coming to India is, the source of the best ideas and the experiences. Let's respect it. And our idea was this, India has the solutions for itself if you apply the right architecture of institutions which are local, empowering communities to think systemically and to collaborate with each other. Upwards, thank you. Brilliant, and, I, and let me bring it right back down to a practical level because I think you've summed that up very well. I'd love a lightning round from each of you just in five words, what, oh, 10 words. <laughs> What is, if, if we gave you a magic wand and said you could build one leading institution in the country, what would it be? Um, Pramit, why don't we start with you? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear that. The, the magic build, wand is? If you could build one leading institution in the country, you've built some already, but if you had to build one more, what would it be? Uh, to provide uh, the highest quality of education to the last student using uh, the online media. Wonderful. Rupa? So I don't know if I can still say adolescent girls since we have Upstra and leadership um, and education, but I guess, as I said at the beginning, I think a care, India really needs to focus on uh, the care economy and getting, getting more women into paid work. And I think there could be an institutional, a role for an institution in that. Aaron? I think a local governance institution, whether in a city or a town or a village, that must be a world-class institution. And we must have a zillion of these or a million of these. So this whole idea of scale again, a good idea applied everywhere by people who know how to run the idea, that's the institutional idea. And therefore, a very local institution, world-class, but a million of them operating all over India. That is what we need. Wonderful. So in my, uh, I want to yield the floor back because we have some great uh, panel coming up, but I just wanted to say, look, the theme really feels like from property rights to democratic rights, from global uh, to local, right? Those are two, I think, important trends that came out. As a, thank you so much for covering what is a very vast topic and uh, doing it so heroically. And uh, thank you to all of you and thanks for everyone who joined.